Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Barry Weiland, and I am the Graduate Program Director for the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape. And so we're here today to present our uh, Master of Environmental Design degree, a master's thesis-based degree offered by the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape. And so I guess just uh, with this tagline, you can change the world. Um, that as a mantra for us within the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape is really profound. It's a, it's a fundamental tenet of the, of the school. And it's, it's really recognizing the fact that design can be thoughtful, can be rigorous, and can have agency in how we make our world. And so that is, those principles underpin our Master of Environmental Design degree. Um, it, we have, I think, a rather novel and innovative uh, school. We um, are richly interdisciplinary. We have professional programs in architecture, planning, and landscape architecture, um, and other degrees, which I'll talk about, uh, and other programs, which I'll talk about in, uh, in a couple more slides. But it's also really important to note that um, we have two campuses. So we are based on the University of Calgary campus proper. Um, and you can see from the, from the slide, we've got facilities for studios, robotics uh, fabrication, and other aspects of digital fabrication and fabrication workshops. And then we also have a dedicated city building design lab, which is located down in downtown Calgary, right next to City Hall. And that lab is, is really set up for us to, to provide avenues for teaching, for connecting to the community, for undertaking research, and for various events and gallery showings. And so it gives us a really strong presence in the public realm and within our communities. Um, being close to downtown allows us to connect with professions as well as other stakeholders within, within the design world. Um, bold thinking for the built environment. Um, this is, I think, some of the, some of the key words that, that we associate with being thoughtful and being innovative in how we make our world. It involves stuff, su um, such facets as social innovation, future thinking, entrepreneurial mindset, community-engaged learning, disruptive design, and of course, research and curation. And I think one of the things to take away about this is it's really important in terms of connecting with our communities, as well as looking for ideas and innovation and novelty in a variety of different places, working with different stakeholders. And the entrepreneurial mindset too, and we'll talk perhaps a bit more about that, but is it, it isn't just about commercialization, rather it's about making things happen. It's about making the world that we are making happen. And it's, again, a fundamental tenet of the school. As I mentioned, the, the CBL, CBDL is right downtown. You can see an image of it uh, in the bottom left of your screen. And within that facility, we actually have various fabrication, digital fabrication capabilities, robotics capabilities. We've got a large gallery space that allows us to connect with our community. And we use that space to have various public events, speaking engagements, gallery shows, community um, receptions, and a variety of other uh, activities that help to connect our design work to various uh, communities, people, stakeholders, et cetera. Um, the entrepreneurial thinking, I think, gets at that idea of how we make our world. Um, we've got some examples here, just in terms of our workshop in the upper right, where students are making um, not just models, but also prototypes of the things that they're working on. We're looking at ways that we can impact our community, and you see a, a landscape intervention in the top left that allows um, uh, young students and, and people of the community to, to better engage with the public spaces that are provided. We have researchers that are also working on aspects of the circular economy and even research on, on radon. Um, and I think Josh will be able to speak to that in a few more slides. We're, we also um, consider ourselves to be social innovators. 
We seek to promote um, aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion within our mantra, within the students that we rec recruit and within our faculty. Um, and we're always looking to make sure that community voices are heard, um, particularly indigenous voices and, um, and people of, of color and other minorities. Um, future thinking, I think fundamentally design is future orientated. It's about how we make the world that we, that we all inhabit, that we share and that we live in. And so we have our students that, and our researchers are taking a look at ways that they can prototype, that they can make, that they can um, work with a variety of different materials and also work on programs that allow for people to co-create and community co-creation and co-design exercises. Um, again, with the CBDL lab and connections to our community, we can foster public uh, lectures, design camps for uh, grade school uh, kids. Um, we can have a number of different types of events, uh, public lectures, et cetera. One of the things and one of the, one of the, I think, key aspects of what we're able to do as well is our Design Matters lecture series. This has been a tenet of ours and, and you know, kudos to uh, our Associate Dean Research, Josh, Josh Tarrant, who's in on this, re, uh, on this call, um, for his initiative with um, some of our other colleagues in developing the Design Matters series. And in a way, it's something that allows us to bring global expertise to Calgary and allow people in a local environment to connect with innovations and design innovators from around the world. Um, notably, um, Michael Adjaye in one of the, in one of in his images down at the bottom, and there are a variety of other key architects that have come to Calgary and spoken via this venue. Um, one of the key tenets of SAPL is our study abroad programs. Now, for folks that are pursuing the Master of Environmental Design, um, the course-based study abroad may not be as, as evident, but one of our programs, uh, or we do have scholarship programs that in support students that wish to publish papers and get presentations uh, into international conferences. And so that's part of the way that we can help people through the M Master of Environmental Design MEDES degree. Uh, speaking of student support, there are a variety of different venues that students can, can gain um, employment and support within our faculty as graduate assistants re research or non-teaching and teaching uh, roles. And so working as a, a teaching assistant or a research assistant with a faculty member, um, those are some of the avenues that are available and can offer some financial support, support to students, as well as a number of awarded uh, scholarships that, that exist through the university and through the school. Um, our student work is varied. And I think, um, I think I'm gonna leave this one to Josh to perhaps talk about where are some other slides later on that really speak to some of the research themes and the research uh, endeavors that our students have, have gotten into and gives you, uh, I think, a, a nice sample of the work that comes out of the faculty. Um, just to, to give you some background, we actually have programs that hit all levels of higher education. So we have um, undergraduates, we, have a, we offer an undergraduate minor program in, known as the Minor of Architecture, as well as more general courses um, under the Architectural Studies mantra. We also have a Master of Landscape Architecture program, a Master of Architecture program, the Master of Planning, and we've, we also have a PhD, and most recently we've introduced a Doctor of Design, doctoral degree, all in addition to the Master of Environmental Design. And so to the Master of Environmental Design, this is a thesis-based degree that's intended to, for students who have achieved a professional degree, uh, typically achieved a professional degree in one of our programs or from abroad or from other schools. And so that means that they have, um, say, a, a professional architecture degree, a professional planning degree, a professional landscape architecture degree. And those can be five-year undergraduate degrees or the result of a course-based master's program. 
And these are typically the students that we are recruiting for this. And we're looking for folks who have a, an expertise that can patch into a number of research projects that occur within, within our school. The structure of the degree, it's intended to be completed uh, within somewhere between 16 and 24 months. Now folks that are, some of the people that we target that are, uh, we recruit for the Master of Environmental Design are coming from our professional programs. They're coming from our Master of Architecture program, uh, Landscape Architecture program and planning programs. And they would likely start in May and be able to complete within 16 months. And so if we take a look at um, the next cohort starting in 2021, May of 2021, they could be finished in September of 2022. And it's an accelerated program that's typically tied to a research project and may include funding that allows them to complete it within such a short time. We also allow for something that is perhaps a little bit more traditional completion of a master's degree within 24 months, starting in the fall, a September start, uh, again, in, in this example, starting in fall of 2021, and eventually finishing at the, either at the end of the spring summer in 2023 or early September. And so within that, we've got very, very dedicated, intense terms um, of coursework in the first two terms, as well as um, working with your supervisor to, to really undertake and complete your, your research in, a, in an effective way. So typically, it takes 16 to 24 months. Note that our students are enrolled in the Faculty of Grad Studies and that SAPL is known as the teaching school or the teaching unit on campus. As such, um, our students can, it's anticipated by FGS that students would finish a master's degree within two years, although they do allow within their regulations up to four years for completion. However, we're really trying to tool our degree around the shorter time frames, and that's in everyone's interest because often the research work and the project work is very timely, it needs to be completed within a particular time frame, and it, it serves the student's interest in achieving the uh, credential in a much, much uh, efficacious way, much more efficacious way. We require that students take three, three uh, required courses and that they enroll in one elective courses. These courses address aspects of developing one's research proposal, uh, research and design research writing, as well as taking a look at design innovation. And the elective is typically anticipated as a course that um, attends the research project that students are working on. And it could include any one of our block courses as well as a number of other electives that are offered within the faculty. Our research is typically project-based led by a faculty member as a principal investigator. Um, and in some, we've been, I think, quite successful in recent years in having a number of such projects that have an industry partner and have been able to provide some funding through the uh, My Tax program. <coughs> Excuse me. Students, in, once they've completed coursework and their proposal has been uh, approved, they would conduct their research, working through various different types of design research investigations. They would capture this within a document, and at the end of, uh, of their thesis tenure, they would have to defend that document and to defend that uh, thesis research within an oral examination. And again, this is consistent with FGS guidelines and regulations, and it is fundamentally the way that the degree works, a thesis degree works. Mm. We have a number of different funding sources, as I said. So we have uh, graduate assistantships uh, for teaching or non-teaching, as well as research assistantships. There are named SAPL scholarships that students can apply for. There are also uh, research expense scholarships available, as well as travel scholarships available to support students presenting their work at international conferences. There are also a number of university scholarships, some of which students are automatically considered, considered for, but others in which they can apply. Externally, students can pursue tri-council, and this would include the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, National Sciences and, uh, and Engineering Research Council, and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. These are the sort of three tri-council agencies, and they have funding to support either interim research projects as well as uh, full-on thesis-based research uh, 
research work. There is also the Alberta Graduate Excellence Scholarship, and we have um, uh, MyTex access to MyTex funding, which is really a, a kind of um, scholarship that's based on industry connections and working on projects with an industry partner. And I think, Josh, would you like to add anything to, to those external research awards? I think not, not so much. I think maybe uh, when, when you're done, I'll be able to sort of maybe revisit uh, some of these things and, and get into a little bit more detail about um, uh, the, the MEDES degree specifically. But yeah, no, I think this is, this is a sufficient thing in terms of talking about the funding, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, and I think this is actually where I can hand off the baton to you in terms of discussing the research themes and future thinking. Great. Um, yeah, so thanks very much, um, Barry, for, for all that. And, and also thanks to everyone who's, who's attending. Um, you know, one of the ways that I like to think about um, how our degree programs relate to one another is that, um, you know, we have, we have a, a limited set of undergraduate offerings. And in that, you know, what we're doing is really um, learning about city building. It's an introduction. Um, when we start to move toward our first professional degrees, the MARC, the, the MPLAN, and the MLA, uh, what we're really doing is uh, helping to uh, engage st students in terms of how to go about city building. So it's, a, it's, in a sense, a training kind of exercise. Uh, it leads to accreditation and, um, and licensure and, and all of this. The ME DES degree, um, it really sort of fills a critical gap between our first professional degrees and something like a PhD. Uh, and here, um, it's really a matter of actually doing city building. It's actually a matter of working on these projects. Uh, one of the things that, that really took me a number of years, I didn't really realize that this was um, an educational fact or an academic uh, reality is that you know, to be a professor, uh, teaching only, can, only makes up 40% of our job profile. Um, the, another 40% of our job profile consists of doing research. Um, and uh, if you look at the University of Calgary at large, it's a research institution. Its primary, which is to say its primary mode of business is doing research projects. Um, and so, uh, our faculty members are largely responsible for um, uh, crafting and identifying and executing these things. But to do research, it takes teams of students uh, and mixtures of different kinds of students to deliver on that. Uh, so you may be in one of the first professional degree programs right now, and you may actually be hired on to some of these uh, research projects. Uh, even in your undergrad, you may have been involved to, uh, in one way or another. And of course, if you're in a PhD program, you're probably connected to research projects in one way or another. Um, but we really, you know, a way of uh, thinking about the MEDES degree in the context of research is that uh, an MEDES student is really a central figure in those projects. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, those students have already been trained. Uh, uh, through their first degree program, um, and the and researchers, faculty members, uh, really need uh, highly trained, capable students uh, to participate in those larger uh, uh, teams. There have been uh, an, the, over the past couple of years, uh, in terms of getting the ME Des program uh, off the ground, what we've done is. Uh, targeted uh, students with particular skill sets, um, you know, in a way where, you know, as faculty members, we're um, engaged in teaching. And so we actually become quite familiar with the student population uh, and, able to and we're able to understand the strengths of, of particular students and recruit them uh, into these projects. Uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, uh, over the past couple of years, we've used MyTax funding as a way to uh, support those students and recruit them into those uh, programs. Uh, looking forward, however, 
what we're doing um, is really expanding that, that cohort, the MEDES cohort, so that we're able to not only, um, let's say, uh, um, elevate and improve our, you know, the magnitude of our research activities, um, but maybe another way that I would put it is that there's an increasing demand uh, on us as an institution to function in a really unique way um, at this particular moment in time in this particular city, uh, this region, and this country. So um, what we see in front of us generally is a world that has a tremendous amount of challenge in front of it. And industry alone um, and the academy alone and cities and the public alone are not able to meet these challenges. And what the university is able to do and what uh, the research enterprise is able to do is start to connect uh, these various stakeholders and these various entities around really pressing challenges uh, to produce new solutions, to think in innovative ways and to operate in interdisciplinary teams. Uh, what's interesting for us as a faculty is that a design-based approach uh, to that uh, is quite empowering, not just for us and for stakeholders, but actually it helps catalyze uh, and connect other disciplines into these kinds of projects. So what you see here um, are a couple of instances of projects that have taken place over the past year or two that align with the CBD Lab's um, sort of advertised themes. So there's a series of grand challenges that came along with us taking over uh, space in that building um, that involve uh, digital fabrication, uh, addressing equity, and really looking at like big data um, in order to understand the kind of uh, trends and trajectories that our cities are taking on. Um, you know, I think maybe maybe another sort of point to, to make about the MEDES degree and the roles that you might play uh, in doing that degree is that it is quite heavily uh, based on uh, industry partnerships um, and, and external stakeholders coming to the faculty asking us uh, to provide help and, and research efforts toward uh, finding solutions that, that they're in search of. Um, so uh, how can I put this? Uh, you know, when you're graduating from your first professional degree, you have, uh, let's say, three kind of options. You know, you can stay in academics, you can go into industry, or you can go into government. Um, and in a first professional degree, generally the move is to go into industry. Um, when you're going into industry uh, and just getting started, generally you're gonna start at the, the bottom floor of that. You come out with your degree and you're green and new. Um, and many of these companies uh, are really hiring you in for just basic horsepower and to, to get you started on things. Um, we can, well, yeah, sure, we can be on this slide. Um, uh, one of the things that the research projects that we're able to take on are actually the things that these companies either aspire to be able to do but can't do it without a partner uh, or it's a matter of meeting demands or exploring demands that they don't have the capacity to deliver on at the moment. Uh, and so what we, what the ME DES uh, degree enables, particularly on industry engaged projects, is that those, those ME DES students are able to both um, uh, become familiar with uh, certain companies and actually do work under their roof um, or at least in the COVID times under their computer networks um, uh, and really learn and train and understand the culture of a place and a culture of practice. But at the same time, a huge percentage of that time is uh, um, spent uh, in a lab um, and, and, and working in an academic context. So uh, what ends up happening is that to complete the MEDES degree, you really not only have your baseline disciplinary, you know, MARC, MPLAN, MLA degree, but you also come out with a very tuned uh, skill set um, and a kind of expert level of understanding that 
that is uh, done in alignment with industry interests uh, and puts you out and differentiates you um, uh, as an individual uh, that's competing in the workplace. So for example, um, we have students that are dealing with uh, digital fabrication. This is something that I personally you know, supervise in my own research projects. Um, so digital fabrication is certainly, and uh, digital tool development is certainly something that sort of exists uh, through a variety of these projects. Uh, or for example, if you see the bottom right, uh, you see uh, the Civic Commons Catalyst project that uh, Alberto de Salvatierra is leading. Uh, this is a project that's done in collaboration with Evergreen, uh, operating out of Toronto, but with uh, presence here in Calgary, the Urban Land Institute, uh, and SAPL. Uh, and what's being done there is it's a collection of multiple data sets uh, and overlapping them to be able to identify underutilized civic assets and underutilized real estate in general uh, in an effort to try to understand how um, COVID and the sort of uh, um, both economic and spatial impacts of that may provide opportunity to rethink how we use uh, space and how we use the city um, and it really is done as a way of activating and mobilizing capital uh, to do new things in new ways that engage communities um, and actually deploy a new way of operating through urban environments. Uh, the Green Alley project is something that we've been doing. Um, it's a three-year project with the Calgary Downtown Association that looks at uh, transforming uh, um, uh, uh, alleyways from being service corridors into amenity scapes in uh, sustainable and environmentally resilient uh, modes. Uh, we see digital masonry. This is a project done in um, uh, collaboration with the Alberta Masonry Association, uh, where we're looking at how uh, something like uh, bricks, which have traditionally been a solely human uh, sort of endeavor of, you know, of bricklaying, uh, may be done uh, in a more collaborative way with robotics and automation. Uh, we have the Parking and Performance Project led by Chris Fox and Mathis Natvik. Uh, that was done in collaboration with the Calgary Parking Authority um, and has since had it found a second life uh, with, uh, with Vivo, um, looking at ways in which um, parking lots can be done in more intelligent ways that are both more social and environmentally resilient uh, that start to produce maps of uh, territories where landscaping uh, may actually function better and provide a more cost-effective and uh, performative way of doing parking, especially as we transition to a society that may be less reliant on, uh, on, uh, on cars. Uh, we also have a lot, the last one I'll speak to is uh, the high performance facades uh, that uh, is being led by Alicia Vesquez. Um, this is a three year project, very, very interesting. It's done in collaboration with Dialogue Design, which is a, a, a design firm, uh, and Ferguson Glass, which is a building envelope uh, fabricator. So what we're looking at there is a way to combine energy performance modeling software along with digital fabrication tools um, uh, and factory in a box solutions to be able to produce facades that deviate from a conventional flat panelized approach to something that's more geometrically articulated as well as higher performing in terms of solar performance um, and uh, building comfort. Um, this is something I, I literally just came from the project meeting on that uh, prior to, to this presentation. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting and exciting stuff to be able to ask the question, how can architecture firms short circuit the conventional sequence of design bid build, in which case architects uh, don't necess wouldn't necessarily have to go through builder contractors, but actually can go direct from design to fabrication uh, in an effort to produce buildings that actually may be more cost effective as well as, um, let's say, avoiding the pitfalls of value engineering coming from 
um, another kind of industrial entity that may be less interested in delivering on design objectives and more interested in their own profitability using non-innovative methods. So we really see ourselves as a, uh, the ME Des degree is a catalyst to innovation um, at a variety of scales. And we really think that it's a privileged position uh, not only to deliver on those projects, but as, we, as the university takes on its growth through focus approach and city building is one of the four themes that the university is taking on, we really see ourselves and our research activities as being a kind of interdisciplinary hub that connects across to other outfits such as engineering, sociology, arts, business, public health, uh, and the like. Uh, and, and really the students in the MEDES program are central in that and leading out on a lot of those project activities. And, and in my mind, doing probably some of the most exciting work that the faculty has on its plate. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll kind of uh, wrap it up there. Uh, I know that uh, we had this scheduled to run until three. Um, I think pro between Barry and I, we do have a, a couple of other obligations to sort of balance between this, but uh, we're happy to take questions um, and hope that this give, has given you a bit more insight into what the degree program offers, how it differentiated from the other degrees that we have, and to give you an idea of some of the research activities that we're undertaking and looking at moving forward. Um, so I was just wondering if I could ask a question. That's okay. Well, first of all, hello to all of you. It's nice to see you again. Um, I'm currently doing my master of planning and I started my application for MEDS and, or MEDS. Um, I was just wondering, um, there's a section that asks us if we have already picked a supervisor or like if they've spoken to any. Um, is it necessary to speak to a supervisor prior to like filling out the application or could you? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to take this, this question. Um, so, you know, as Barry was describing the, the, the degree, there really are in a sense two kind of options. Uh, one is sort of a self-guided research, and the other is to be connected with faculty research efforts. Um, I think as the university moves into its growth through focus um, plan, and SAPL becomes more and more of both a front door to the community in terms of um, uh, looking for research efforts and support, and as we are being tasked with connecting across the university, it's very likely that in our, just the basic capacity, the supervisory capacity of the faculty is that um, we will likely, the bulk of our MEDES students will be um, attached to, uh, to these uh, faculty-led research projects. Um, so that by necessity, um, means that a student would be working on projects that are led by a faculty member and thereby produce a supervisory relationship that operates in that way. But even if you're doing um, self-guided, a uh, self-guided MEDES, you still need a supervisor attached to it. And it's, it actually doesn't work to assume that you could just apply and, uh, and a supervisor uh, could sort of magically appear for you. Part of the application is, in fact, to have the supervisor who is agreed to take you on, which has a lot to do with conceptual alignment, expertise, capacity, uh, loading, uh, all of those things. So it is, it, it's absolutely necessary to be connected to a supervisor. Um, yes. Yeah. If I can add to that, um, good question. It, it also helps your chances in applying if you've already established a relationship with a potential supervisor um, and kind of sussed out where the research question is going. Um, the other thing that's helpful too is the, the application requires letters of reference. And so if one of those letters is actually from a potential supervisor, it again strengthens the application. So something to keep in mind. Thank you. I have another question there from, from Ji Sun. 
Hi, Barry. Hello, how are you doing? Not too bad. Toronto, it's getting colder here. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, just, I mean, I was just about, about, uh, a lot curious about this, this thing, actually. So I was having some conversation with my potential supervisor. Um, and I guess, you know, most of my friends uh, who have either graduated from SAPL or is st still studying in SAPL, uh, haven't really done it. And basically the, the, the story is, you know, when you do MEDES, you are going to be placed in a very special research position. And, you know, even if you're working with the industry to conduct that research, after you graduate, you know, there's a risk of potentially being stuck to that research. And there might not be as many uh, individuals or firms or offices in the industry that might not be interested in these research that I'm conducting. So, um, I mean, frankly, I was, you know, getting ready myself to get out in the, in the industry and start working next year. But at the same time, does seem a super great um, opportunity. So I'm still thinking, but what are your, I, I mean, I don't know, what do you, what do you think? I'm happy to take that. I'm happy to take that question. Um, mm -hmm. So I think to start, it's to say that doing the ME Des degree doesn't mean that all of the, your previous training goes away. So you have the same level of baseline skill sets. You just have more. Um, the second is that uh, the vast majority of our projects are done in partnership with industry, which is to say that industry is interested in those skill sets. I mean, we know that things like uh, digital design and fabrication is something that the industry not, is not only interested in having to do, but, but knows that it has to do it. Um, but, it. but one of the things that's preventing them from moving in that direction is a lack of skill sets. Uh, it, it, it's to say that the workforce doesn't have the training. So uh, doing the MEDES often leads to borderline leadership positions in those firms, or at least a leadership track um, uh, in those firms. I think, for example, um, about uh, uh, a very recent grad, uh, Nick Hamill, uh, who did hit, uh, really a, a unbelievably specialized uh, um, uh, thesis. And, and maybe, maybe one of the, the points I would make about this that, that maybe I didn't articulate in the presentation is that the, the, the research projects that, that a student might be hired onto in the degree is not one and the same as your thesis. So it's just, it's just one component of it that may actually build your expertise, but, but you can sort of extract um, aspects of it and construct your own position. Um, so, so Nick was able to focus on um, digital fabrication and mass timber um, and has since been hired by Intelligent City in Vancouver, where his position is basically 50%, you know, kind of architectural, regular, straightforward architecture stuff, you know, uh, modeling, drawing, whatever. And the other 50% of his profile is doing code development. Uh, for the processes that they're dealing with, which has to do with codifying everything from supply chain to digital fabrication to assembly and construction. So um, it's, it's also to maybe, at least from the architectural side of things, and I'm sure it's the case in other disciplines as well, is that the, the, the discipline itself has actually kind of shrunk over time and it's outsourced a lot of its um, historical capabilities to other consultants, uh, you know, structural, whatever. Um, uh, and now we see architecture uh, trying to recapture some of that and expand its territory so that it's about more than just designing buildings, but it's actually managing the processes and the systems that uh, that are capable of producing those forms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a matter of um, becoming more educated uh, and becoming more expert than just putting parts of materials together. Uh, but it's also engaging things like communities, uh, learning how to address the, complex the complexities of financial models, 
um, understanding the politics behind things and the various you know stakeholder elements. Um, I, in a lot of ways, I think that it's how can I put it? It's never it's never a problem to be able. Uh, to develop expertise in a certain area, especially if by comparison, you're n there's not another opportunity to develop expertise in a different direction, right? So if, it, if the comparison is, am I picking the right expertise, the right area to develop expertise in versus not really developing expertise, then it's not really, it's not a unique claim to worry about one or the other. But I, but I think it's to say that the structure of our um, project intake and project development is such that we are interested in remaining aligned uh, with industry and at the same time moving industry in a direction that we know it needs to go, but it can't really do that by itself. Yeah, if I, if I could add to that, um, just that idea that actually a lot of the research projects are areas that, that industry is not well positioned to tackle alone. And that the, the, the partnership and the engagement with SAPL and with our expertise is actually helping to grow innovation within those firms. And so part of the way to look at it is, is that expertise, it doesn't pigeonhole you, it becomes more of a springboard and can launch you and your career can go in a variety of different directions from that, depending on how you, how you end up working it. So I think that that's a, a, perhaps a, a stronger way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, if time allows, if I ask one quick question. So I was told that, I mean, like, like you guys also presented in a presentation uh, that I'll be also working with the industry as a partner. Um, does, is that like eight months with industry in eight months with uh, supervisor, or could it be divided into four months, four months, four months, four months? And most essentially, uh, and, and importantly, are you able to log your hours as, for example, architectural intern, if you like while doing the research together with the partner? Or is it not really working, like it's research, so it's not really classified under architectural internship log hours? Yeah, so, so that, that's, a really, that's a really important question. So, and it's something that we've had to, that it's important uh, that, that we're, we make an effort to clarify with our industry partners. Um, those projects are not a matter of doing the project when you're in the lab and then being a regular intern there, the other 50%. It's that 100% of the time you're working on the research project. It's just that 50% of the time, minimum 50% of the time, you're under their roof, in a sense, and the other 50% of the time, you're, you're in the lab. And so there's different resources and capabilities and, and, and aspects to each of those tasks. Um, one of the ways that, that my, pro, my MyTax projects have worked is that uh, we, we do the first half of the project uh, in, in the office and the second half in the lab uh, which is to say that um, another way that we split that out is that we do the bulk of the project in the office and then we do the bulk of the publication activities. Um, so peer review publications, refining the stuff, maybe outputting a few more things. We do that in the lab on the second half. Uh, but, but it is 100% research project um, activities. Uh, you're not doing any of the sort of general intern grunt work. Uh, uh, in, a, in a firm that, that there's no there's no value for them or, or let's say there may be value for them in trying to do that but we are quite committed to uh, not only student experience but also just delivering on the requirements of those research projects uh, as as sort of drafted in the in the applications okay. thank you very much all right it looks like we've got one more question from Sean yeah hello Hello. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm from India, and uh, yeah, it's early morning here, so hope you are all safe there. Yeah. So basically, so I'm on my process of my application for fall 2021 September, and uh, regarding some sort of a document. So they had mentioned of something about a funding plan. No, is it the right time to speak about the application as well here? Mm -hmm. Um, so it, did you want to take that one? 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'll just add on. So the one thing is about the funding plan. And also there's something called a co-op program, which I researched on in the website. Mm -hmm. So like, will I be still eligible? See, I finished my five years undergraduate mm -hmm. and in 2018 and now I'm currently working. So how will I be still eligible to apply for that course as well? I'm sorry, apply for the co-op aspect? Yeah, co-op aspect. And the other question is about the funding plan. So what does that mean? Like, how should I prove it to uh, well, admin? Part of it is for international students, they, as part of our immigration process, they have to demonstrate that they can actually fund their degree. So to, be, to, to get the student visa so that they can operate here. So there's usually a, a point where you can, you can illustrate that you do in fact have the funds to support yourself as a student while you're here. Um, the other role that the funding plan plays is to identify any um, scholarships that you may have um, from your home country that could support you while you're coming in or if you've been in touch with a supervi potential supervisor and th there has been some negotiation around a potential uh, scholarship support or what have you, that can also be included in it. But uh, so typically it's, it's for international students, you're really just trying to demonstrate that you have the funds to pursue the degree here. Um, okay. That's I think a, a, a crucial point. Um, yes. For the co-op program, um, I'm actually not entirely sure. So, so maybe I could, uh, maybe yeah. if I if I could see if I understand the question correctly. Um, we don't have a co-op program. We don't have a job placement program, but it it does speak to the importance, as Barry was mentioning, of reaching out and connecting with a supervisor or a potential supervisor because that that pairing is really essential to uh, to admittance. Um, and so uh, uh, there some in some cases uh, an ME des uh, uh, position may actually come with something that resembles full funding uh, you know where it's you just have it all the way around but but that really is on a per project and per supervisor basis it's not something that the degree necessarily guarantees onto it so the, uh, to get back to the question of the funding plan, there's any, there's any numbers of ways to sort of present or declare how, um, how uh, you'll end up paying or being funded uh, through the thing. It's just a matter of being able to, to demonstrate that you can, can cover the costs of the program, um, whether that's um, you know, uh, personally carried uh, or whether it comes through a mixture um, or a blend. Uh, so someone could come and, you know, in a sense, pay for it all. Um, another person can get, uh, full, uh, in a sense, fully funded, and there's a lot of options in between. One of the things that I think is worth noting, however, though, is that um, there are a number of course offerings that the faculty delivers across all of its degree programs. And, uh, and we really do try to prioritize uh, the hiring of ME DES students to those teaching assistantship positions uh, because uh, generally those students will have um, uh, a little bit more expertise, a little bit more time under their belt. And so it makes them suitable uh, as teaching assistants. And that is, that's another way, aside from research project hires and aside from scholarships, that uh, students can get a little bit more money in their pocket uh, while they're earning their degrees. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think with that, we will wrap up. Um, as Josh noted, we've got some other commitments this afternoon that we have to, have to get to. Um, I want to extend my thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, if you do have questions about the program and have questions about the application process, our graduate program administrator, Jennifer Taufer, is on the call right now, and her email is front and center in the applications page from the SAPL website. So one can please um, connect with her. She's just put her email into the chat. I also want to extend my thanks to Vita Leung and Nicola Johnson and Jessica Alvler for their support in setting up and running this meeting. Uh, couldn't have happened without you guys. And so um, a gracious thank you to you all. 
Um, and I think with that, um, if you do have other questions about the nature of the degrees, you can also email me. Um, and Josh, I'm sure you're open to taking similar emails as well. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Okay, everyone. Great. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Take care.